Hello, good morning, and welcome to our special Tundra Connections webcast for International Polar Bear Day. We're so happy that you could join us here today, and we're so excited to talk to you about polar bears, specifically moms and cubs. My name is Alisa McCall, and I am with Polar Bears International, and I'm joined here today by two fantastic colleagues. BJ, could you introduce yourself briefly? Sure. So, uh, BJ Kirschhofer, Director of Field Operations for um, I could typically I'd get to spend a fair amount of time in the field every year and some of it working with Megan on polar bear maternal dens, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Yes, and we're also joined by Dr. Megan Owen. Thank you so much for joining us today, Megan. Could you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? About yourself? Sure thing. It's so wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, I am the Corporate Director of Wildlife Conservation Science at San Diego Zoo Global. And in my role, I've had the, I have the pleasure of overseeing a diverse array of scientists that apply uh, different scientific disciplines to conservation. And I have been working in the Arctic and studying the Arctic for the past 25 years. And uh, a big part of my uh, work in the past decade has been focused on polar bears and polar bear conservation. And um, I've been working with PBI on maternal denning, and I'm excited to talk more about that today. Well, thank you. We are so excited to have you with us today and to learn more about these very exciting research projects and more about moms and cubs across the Arctic and anything else about polar bears that you want to know. So we would like to encourage you to please ask your questions in the chat box wherever you're watching this. Maybe you are on our Tundra Connections webpage, maybe you're on Facebook, but there are opportunities for you to send your questions to us and we have some fantastic moderators who are watching them. They can answer you back directly or they'll shoot your questions over to me and we'll hopefully be able to answer them live. So please at any time send us your questions. And again, I just wanted to, Reiterate that we are here for International Polar Bear Day, which is this Saturday, February 27th. All week long, we're having live events. Uh, we're doing tons of social media, lots of different ways you can get involved. On Saturday itself, there's a really great art project that you can get involved with on our Facebook page and then a screening of a short video as well. So if you're interested in polar bears, this is a great, great week to find out more. And we're also doing live events tomorrow and Friday. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna dive into some polar bear information, but first I wanna ask you one question. So we have a few questions to ask you throughout this webcast. So if you have a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, if you could write your answer down or tell your guardian who's with you or maybe your friends, talk amongst yourselves for a minute. We wanna see what you know. And also feel free to chat your answers back in the chat window too. So first question for you, where do polar bears live? Do they live in the Antarctic? Do they live in the Arctic? Or do they live with pandas? So the, the question was, do polar bears live in the Antarctic, Arctic, or with pandas? Hmm, where do you think? I think I'm hearing mostly Arctic. That's right, polar bears live in the Arctic. So we're gonna give you a little bit of polar bear one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, BJ, could you start off? Could you tell our viewers a little bit about why polar bears are in the Arctic? What are they doing up there? One second, Beej, we lost your audio. Stand by one second, we have a little audio difficulty. <laughs> Quick technical glitch, we'll be back on track. Can also try Megan. Yeah, let's uh, maybe pivot to Megan there. Megan, could you uh, take that Great. question for us? Sure thing. So polar bears <laughs> have evolved to thrive in the Arctic. And uh, it's not just um, the cold weather that polar bears love. It is access to the fat rich seals that they depend on. So polar bears are actually classified as marine mammals because they depend on that ocean ecosystem for their survival. And over millennia, they have evolved a number of adaptations which allow them to survive and again, thrive on the Arctic sea ice. And so they have um, uh, physical adaptations like uh, the bottom of their feet uh, have a little bit sort of no skid traction on them that helps them move about the sea ice. They're excellent swimmers and they can navigate uh, the sea ice in its many forms when it's a little bit more broken up or when it's solid. 
they're able to get around quite efficiently. But it really is those seals which have allowed polar bears to survive in the, the harsh environment of the Arctic. Tons of calories allow them to layer on that body fat, which allows them to survive for, for days and weeks without getting their next seal meal. But if they don't get that next seal meal, they're going to be in big trouble. Thanks for that answer, Megan. And you mentioned the adaptations that polar bears have to live in the Arctic, to walk on the sea ice, to swim, and to hunt seals. And I just wanted to show our viewers a couple of quick examples of these adaptations. So one adaptation, of course, Megan mentioned the feet um, and claws are part of the feet. So this is a polar bear claw right here. And you can see how very, very thick and very, very sharp this claw is. This is the perfect claw to give you a little bit of traction on sea ice and to hook seals, slippery seals from out of the water up onto the sea ice. Now you can compare this claw with a brown bear claw. So this is a brown bear claw here on the top now. And this is much longer, thinner, and slightly duller than the polar bear claw. And this is for brown bears who walk on land. They're terrestrial bears. They do a lot more digging. Maybe they're flipping logs over looking for food. This is a land bear <laughs> claw. And this, again, on the lower here, this is the polar bear claw. So you can see quite a bit of difference. Polar bears very well adapted for the sea ice habitat and hunting seals. And another great example of an adaptation is of course their fur. So polar bears have two layers of very thick fur. The one closest to the skin is thick, thick, thick. This would be like us wearing a, a very woolly sweater, uh, keeping us nice and warm. And then the layer over top, these are longer hairs. These are kind of like the rain jacket. So these are whisking weather away, keeping water off the bear's skin. And between these two layers of fur, the polar bear is staying very, very warm in the Arctic, even when it's minus 40 degrees or colder. Um, the fur looks white, of course. It's not actually white. Polar bear fur is transparent, so it's clear, and it's hollow. And the hollowness also helps the polar bear trap warm heat against its body and stay warmer in the cold environment. So this bear is very much an Arctic bear, very much suited for life on Arctic sea ice. Uh, when they're swimming, of course, the, the fur doesn't help as much, but that thick layer of body fat does. So lots of reasons that polar bears live in the Arctic. And of course, because they live there, that's where they have their babies. So we are gonna pivot a little bit and talk about the polar bear life cycle. So this one, I'm gonna throw over to BJ. BJ, if we have your audio back, I assume we do. We hope. Sounding good? All right, <laughs> so we're, <laughs> it sounds good to me. So we wanna talk a little bit about the polar bear life cycle. And I think we might have a graphic somewhere, or at least we can pull up some cool photos for you guys. BJ, could you kind of broadly walk us through what goes on in the life of a polar bear? Sure, so, you know, maybe we'll just start with this time of year. Um, this time of year right now is when polar bears are giving birth to their young and raising them so that they can um, survive in the cold temperatures of the Arctic. Polar bears are born really, really small, like one pound small, like four sticks of butter kind of small, so really tiny. And that's far too little to survive on its own in the cold temperatures of the Arctic. Here's some neat uh, video here um, of a mom and a baby. So, uh, so what's kind of neat is that polar bears have figured out, well, we can give birth to really tiny cubs, but we need to protect them in a safe place until they're big enough to be able to walk around on the cold snow. And so this is, these are the maternity dens that polar bears are in right now. Um, these places could be out on the sea ice. Here's a good example, a picture of polar bears denning on land uh, near the boreal forest, probably near Churchill in Northern Canada. Polar bears in Norway could be denning up in the high mountains. So really wherever there's enough snow that can accumulate where they can dig in and build a snow cave is probably pretty good polar bear den habitat. Um, uh, you know, there are some examples where they might uh, dig into some mud or some dirt, some peat moss as well, but, uh, but eventually it basically becomes a snow cave, a snow fort for polar bears. So that's what's happening right now. Pretty soon, almost any day now, polar bears will start coming out for the very first time. They're going to start emerging from the den. Most, most times it'll be the mother that comes out first, of course, because she has to break out of the snow cave. 
And then in the days and weeks that follow, the cubs will come out too. Sometimes they just come out and leave and uh, scamper out to the sea ice. And sometimes they spend a fair amount of time. And, uh, and this is some good video here from a polar bear family that uh, has grown the cubs up large enough. The females grown the cubs large enough so that they can take off and go look for seals, their favorite food. The next two years now will be spent with mom. These cubs will grow bigger and bigger at a crazy rate. In fact, in a couple years here, if we were to see the same family group, you might not be able to tell which one is mother and which one are the cubs. They will be pretty close to the same size for the most part, um, depending on gender of the cubs and things like that. So pretty neat. Um, that's what happens. And then once bears hit two and a half years old or so, maybe close to three years old in some places, mom says, time to get lost and, uh, and become an adult bear yourself. Um, and, uh, and the whole process starts again. So BJ, how many cubs does a mother polar bear usually have at one time? Yeah, so one to, know. yeah, that's a good question. You know, one to three, mm -hmm. I think is what, what, mm -hmm. uh, what the average is or, or what could happen. Two or just less than two is the average. Um, if you were tuning into the explore.org cams this fall from Churchill, we saw a family group of three. Um, that seems to be uh, more and more rare recently, uh, finding three cubs. Partly, partly that has to do with how good the mother is doing. If polar bears are super well fed, the chances of having more cubs is, is greater. But if you have a, a female polar bear that hasn't gotten as much food, um, because food's hard to find for a variety of reasons, which we'll talk about, um, you know, she'll have less cubs. Megan, BJ mentioned uh, the dens, talked a little bit about dens. Is it only these pregnant females that go into dens or do we see other bears, other polar bears also use dens for any reason? That's, that's a great question. I think when people think about bears, they think about hibernation. It's sort of like that classic vision of bears. But it, for polar bears, it really is only the pregnant females that go into dens. So they really, really need those dens to successfully uh, be pregnant and to give birth to healthy cubs. And as BJ mentioned, you know, the, the, the environment in the Arctic is so cold and that's, that's a big demand on a, a little cub when it comes out of the den. So that time in the den is absolutely critical for the cubs to gain the, the strength and the body mass and the coordination to survive outside the den with their moms. The other thing to, to consider, too, is that when moms go into their dens in the fall, they don't get to eat again until they get back out of the den in the spring with their cubs. And so there's kind of this, this contrast happening between what the mom needs and what the cubs need. Mom is, is sitting tight and, and waiting for the cubs to grow and develop and to gain strength, but she also wants to get out of that den so that she can get another seal to eat and replenish her fat reserves. So it's a really interesting process. And it's one of these, these things that makes polar bears a, a truly unique and spectacular example of, of adaptation and evolution. That's so amazing. I mean, I don't like it when I have to miss lunch and for these polar bears mom to go, polar bear moms to go months and months without eating really is incredible and a testament to their strength. And so I want to back up a little bit. You both have told us such fantastic information about these moms and cubs. And we do know a, a good amount about the polar bear life cycle and about moms and cubs, but this is not easy information to learn about. Of course, these families are so vulnerable and to learn about moms and cubs who are in their den without disturbing them is a really tricky thing to do. Because of course, at the end of the day, we wanna make sure they're protected and that anything we're learning is not disturbing them. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we learn about moms and cubs and especially how we learn about them in a way that doesn't bother them, that we can just observe them. And so we are gonna talk about a few different ways that we've learned about moms and cubs and polar bears over the years. And I think we're gonna start with um, a really kind of old school way that 
researchers used to learn about polar bears decades ago before we had the fancy technology that we're going to talk about soon here but it was really very much just observations i think norwegian skiers were maybe some of the first folks to actually look at these polar bears there you go bj could you tell us a little bit about uh, what these guys were doing out there yeah so there's some pretty fascinating studies uh out of Norway. Um, and the Norwegians had found some places where polar bears were denning in really high densities. Um, you know, more than 10 bears, uh, groups of families together in, in one snowbank, if you will, kind of one big hillside. Um, and they were able to go out on ski, uh, ski trips, even a, a trip more like a day and go and look at what the bears are doing and make notes with, you know, just a pen and paper or pencil and paper and see what they were doing, when they were coming out, who was doing what. And uh, and that's really kind of some of the early work on polar bears. It's, it seems amazing to us right now. Um, I think probably Megan would agree here that when we go out, we're, we're hoping to find just one polar bear den, but to think that there might be more than 10 all in the same area is just totally wild um unfortunately the bears don't den in that same area anymore uh or at least not very often so yeah so it's really just simply how you know if you're if you knew nothing about something at all and you want to learn about it just watching that something whatever it is so these scientists would just watch the polar bears and make notes and that gives you kind of a baseline information about what's what's normal what do polar bears do BJ, you mentioned something there that um, denning in this region has changed and it's changed in different areas across the Arctic, but Norway has seen a big change in kind of the denning patterns of their polar bear moms. Megan, I was wondering if you could briefly tell our viewers a bit about the changes in Norway that these polar bears are experiencing in terms of denning. Sure, well, climate change, you know, and the warming associated with climate change is having a huge impact on the circumpolar Arctic. So all around the Arctic, we're seeing changes in the extent and, and the, the amount of time that the sea ice is at its maximum. And that sea ice, again, is just critical for polar bear survival. It not only provides them with that access to the seals they need to survive, but it also allows them to access uh, important denning areas. So I think um, we, we're talking about sea ice and polar bears' dependence on it, but most polar bears actually den on land. It's not all polar bears, but most. And in Svalbard, at this, this northernmost outpost of Norway, polar bears rely on uh, these land-based denning areas. Um, but the sea ice losses in that part of the Arctic have been dramatic. And so some of these historically uh, really well used denning areas are not as accessible to polar bears. And we think that that's driving a reduction of their use. And, and that's, that's a challenge for polar bears because over, over evolutionary time, polar bears would have uh, chosen certain areas to den because of the quality of that habitat because it afforded them certain things that, that enhanced the likelihood that their cubs would survive. And so losing access to those denning areas is, is a big challenge for polar bear populations. It absolutely is. This is such um, an important thing to talk about in terms of polar bears. So Megan mentioned climate change, but what does that actually mean and why is that affecting sea ice? Well, when humans burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas, for things like transportation or heating our homes, we release carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Climate change and is carbon already emissions in regular amounts um, are not too bad. You know, they, they'll trap some heat, but we can keep the earth warm in regular amounts. But humans have figured out how to use this energy source. And decades ago, we really didn't know the impact of these carbon emissions. And so we were burning rampant amounts of fossil fuels and releasing rampant amounts of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And what this has done it is it's thickened this heat trapping blanket around Earth. And now we have too thick of a blanket and we are too warm and there's nowhere for this heat to escape. And basically, I think all of you know, ice doesn't like the heat. They don't play well together. So when things get too warm, ice will melt. And that's what we are seeing in the Arctic. We are seeing, um, especially in certain areas, ice melting faster. We're losing how much ice cover we have and how thick the ice is. Now there are 19 different polar bear subpopulations around the world in Canada, the US, 
Norway, Russia, and Greenland. So these polar bears do experience all you know different types of sea ice and and different geographies and things like that. But at the end of the day, all polar bears do need sea ice, and they are seeing changes in their habitat. So there's where all the polar bears live, and you can see they live where there is Arctic sea ice. Now in places, for example, in Hudson Bay, which is just to your, the right of your screen, they're right lower. In Hudson Bay, Canada, we have some of the world's most southernmost polar bears. And these polar bears are experiencing sea ice loss um, at a rate that we've been able to document for the last couple of decades. And as a result of the sea ice loss, of course, the bears aren't getting as many calories, they're not eating as much. And we have seen changes in the number of cubs they're having. They're having fewer cubs. They're smaller overall, these bears, and we have seen a population decline. So this is why we are concerned about polar bears and especially about moms and cubs because moms and cubs are so critical to populations and it's so important that we study them. But again, study them in a way that does doesn't disturb them because that's the last thing they need is more disturbance. So I want to circle back to how we study moms and cubs. We talked a little bit about how, you know, back in the day before fancy technology, you could just ski in and just watch and be quiet and observe. And we can still do that, but in slightly different ways now. And so I would like to take us back to Norway for a moment and talk about our maternal den project that both BJ and Megan have been involved with. And if the world is a little different right now, they might both be in Norway at the moment working on this project, but right now they're doing it from afar. So BJ, I'll throw it back to you for a minute. Could you please tell us a little bit about this fantastic den monitoring project? Sure. You know, so we, Megan and I have been working together for a while on this. And recently, uh, we've been working uh, to make our own cameras. So we've been using single board computers. And I've been putting together some hardware here. And Megan's lab has been making software from scratch. You know, we decide what we want to look at. And the programmers there build the program in order to do exactly what we want. So we take these little cameras here that are really energy efficient and we put them in huge coolers um, or insulated boxes to keep them safe uh, so that polar bears don't get them and so the batteries stay warm. And we go, we work with the Norwegian Polar Institute, the, um, the local uh, government arm of the research group there in Norway and Megan and I find out where the bears are from them. And sometimes they go with us to go travel to the den locations. And very quietly, we spend about a little over an hour um, in front of the den, maybe a couple hundred meters in front of the den. We pop this camera right in front and then we leave. We ski away, spending very little time making as little noise as possible. And, uh, and then we just let our cameras do the work. So they sit out there for months at a time. Um, recording everything that happens um, there at the den site. And that's how we learn, you know, what's happening, how long the bears spend there, how many bears, how many cubs come out of the dens, what they do, uh, things like that. That's pretty spectacular. You know, we always get questions about how one can become a polar bear scientist or how did you start researching polar bears? And I think that what BJ just said is such a great example of it takes all sorts of people to pull off a project like this. So some come from maybe a harder science background, maybe some are computer programmers. BJ is like the engineer on our staff. Uh, Megan's up there with her biology knowledge and other extensive knowledge. And they're all working together with these Norwegian teams and other partners to collaborate on this big project. So there's all sorts of different ways that people can use their different skill sets and apply them to whatever you want to work on. And I think that's such a great, great example of, you know, you can do whatever you want to do with your skills. I want to encourage people again, please do uh, send us your questions, ask anything you want to know. It doesn't necessarily have to be about moms and cubs, anything polar bear related would be great. Uh, you should see options in whatever chat window you're viewing this on right now to plunk your questions in. And I'd like to take one right now. This is from Cameron. BJ, I'm going to ask you, has a bear ever destroyed one of your cameras? You know, uh, we have had had a few instances of uh, bears getting our cameras. We also have had muskox trample everything. Believe it or not, in Alaska one year, um, muskox came up and uh, and flattened my solar panels, uh, pushed everything over. Somehow, all of everything made it. Um, we've never, gosh, I don't think we've ever actually lost any equipment because of a bear attack. We've lost a few plastic latches. Bears are really smart animals. 
and they seem to figure out what the weakness is in, in whatever might be in front of them. Um, so latches on these things seem to be maybe the, the biggest target. Every once in a while, they push everything over. That's a good question, though, but we've been pretty lucky. Um, yeah, very few damaged coolers. That's pretty funny. You guys do a very good job of trying to make those coolers blend in with the environment, too. And a hungry polar bear emerging from the den probably just has seals on the brain, hopefully. So that's a great answer. Okay. And Megan, I've got a question for you from Lexi. Do siblings ever stay together after leaving their mother? Wow, that, that's a great question. I think from, from what little evidence we have, it can happen. Um, I, eventually they are, of course, going to separate when they become fully adult uh, bears and, and move on to other things. But, uh, you know, survival in the Arctic is challenging. And, and at that, that point when mom is just done with her cubs, you know, when they're about two, two and a half, maybe three years old, siblings might rely on each other for, for survival, for finding seals, and for just being aware of what's the threats in their environment and what's going on. But again, you know, it's really, the details are really, uh, they're few and far between. It, studying polar bears is extraordinarily challenging. And as we were talking earlier about the early times in Norway of studying maternal dens, all of everything we understand about polar bears, the, the early researchers just uh, really worked incredibly hard, almost heroically, to, to better understand these amazing bears out on the sea ice, high in the Arctic, spending hours and hours and days and days out in this incredibly challenging environment. I really just, it inspires me um, for the future, thinking about what was done in the past. Yeah, I totally that agree really with that, Megan. Amazing. You know, I think we get, we, t we, we have it pretty easy. You know, we get to uh, go to places like Nor the Nor Norwegian Polar Institute's base, which is all established in this place at 79 i think it's 79 north latitude and then we just get to launch off from their base to go do this work uh we're back in the old days you know they had to set up this stuff all by themselves and i said that earlier that the researcher would just kind of go on skis and look at stuff but if you imagine trying to get ready for all that all the food you had to get ready just to survive out there for months and months it would have been incredibly difficult we have it so easy now Really, you guys are making me feel very <laughs> easy too. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the PBI polar bear tracker, which also follows moms and cubs on the sea ice. But um, again, not like we used to. I mean, we're not out there watching these moms and cubs travel across these huge areas. We are using technology and I'm sitting at home at my computer downloading polar bear locations and posting them online for you all to see too. So we really have come so far. This is another incredible way to learn more about polar bears because of course, when they emerge from their den and they head out onto the ice to hunt seals, it becomes even harder to find out what they're doing. But so, so important to know a bit more about how do they navigate their sea ice habitat? Where are they moving? When? Why are they making these decisions? Where are they finding their food? There's so many questions we have and following them with GPS collars can really, really help us understand more about polar bears. And so in certain populations, female polar bears do a subset of them. So really just a handful every year, up to 10 sometimes, uh, can be fitted with these GPS collars that fall off after a year or two, and they send a satellite all sorts of information about where the bear is. And then again, scientists can sit at home, ask the satellite for the data and just download it. So there's an example of the collar there. And many females over the years have worn these collars and given us just the most incredible data on where these bears are moving. And many of these females do have cubs. So I do encourage you to check out the Polar Bears International Bear Tracker. I believe there are five polar bears being tracked right now still with collars. Those collars are set to fall off soon. So hopefully um, we can track the bears until at least the summer. And then potentially in the fall, a handful of more polar bears will be collared. We do have different ways to track polar bears these days. We do have GPS ear tags that have been deployed in the Church of Manitoba region, um, at least, and those can be put more on males and subadults as well. Males cannot wear GPS collar because their necks are thicker than their heads. They kind of have cone heads, so they can pull the collars off really, really easy. So instead, we can fit them with the GPS ear tag, which doesn't last as long, but still gives important information. And we are also working on a burr on fur project with 3M 
working to see if we can stick a tracker onto a polar bear fur and have it fall off naturally when the bear sheds. So there's more information on our website about those topics. And we can also answer more questions about those topics. But I do want to come back to Moms and Cubs for a minute. And I'd like to talk about another project we have with Denning Moms and Cubs. And so BJ, I'm going to throw it back to you for a minute to talk about our fairly new SAR project. So first of all, what is SAR? Ooh, that's a good question. So SAR is synthetic yeah. aperture radar. Uh, three big words. Really what it means is we're synthesizing a very big antenna by using movement. So we're putting, we're working with, uh, with Brigham Young University, a bunch of students down there, and we're using movement of a radar to see if we can uh, see through snow and what might be underneath there. So this is pretty important for a couple reasons. If we know where polar bears are, we can better protect them. And this would be important for places like maybe Northern Alaska, where there's uh, a lot of interest in, in extracting resources like oil and gas. Um, right now we don't have very good tools on figuring out where polar bears are. We know where the odd radio collar bears are, but most polar bears don't, aren't wearing radio collars. So um, this tool could potentially allow us to fly over the denning habitat and kind of see through the snow and spot where all the polar bears are down there. Fingers crossed, um, we're still testing this, but we're quite hopeful that it could work in the future. That would be pretty exciting. And do you think that this could be used in areas all across the Arctic potentially? I think so. I mean, I think the hope is that maybe potentially Megan and I could use this as well in Norway. Uh, maybe we could find new areas of high density denning working with the Nor Norwegian Polar Institute. Maybe there's places that bears are, are uh, denning in higher densities like they used to. We just don't know because we haven't had a good tool uh, to be able to look. Well, this is a very exciting research project and at Polar Bears International, we are fundraising for it right now with a Toonie fundraiser for Polar Bear Day. And there's lots more information about it on our website and maybe our mods can plunk you down some information uh, from our website more about this great Moms and Cubs project. So we do have more questions coming in, which is fantastic. I'd love to take a couple right now. Uh, Megan, I'm going to give this one to you. It's very interesting. I don't think I've heard this one before. Do male polar bears ever invade the dens? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so just to back up a little bit, male polar bears are typically not found in the denning areas where, where females spend their overwinter time. And that's typically good news for female polar bears because they don't want to be disrupted in any way. Um, there is increasing evidence or, you know, we're, we're seeing more frequent occurrences where males may intrude upon the denning area and in some cases very very few but some cases have been documented where a male polar bear would break into the den and attack the mother and and neonates the young cubs so that's something that we think might be exacerbated again by climate change um, we don't know for sure whether these are what we would call a predatory uh, attack so that the, the male is actually seeking out the female t as a potential food source. Um, and that, again, we think it could be a byproduct of climate change. Uh, for, for polar bears, the biggest impact um, from climate change is reduced hunting opportunities. And so um, if a hungry polar bear can't find a seal, they might look for other sources of energy. Ooh, thank you for that answer. That was such an interesting question. And BJ, I'm gonna throw another question your way. Have you ever seen any other animals on the camera? And this is from Shauna in Winnipeg. Um, we have seen muskox on the camera in Northern Alaska. That's very cool. Uh, my first year on the project, um, it was our job after the female left to go in and measure the dens. One of the dens, we had an, a red fox moved in. And this is, uh, this we could have a whole nother webcast on, on, on red fox versus Arctic fox and, and climate change, but we'll, we'll stay on topic here. But we had a red fox that moved into the abandoned polar bear den. And uh, so we got lots of red fox footage. And of course we weren't able 
to get into that den because you don't want to be messing with uh, fox. Um, so uh, what else have we seen? I think we've seen a lot of caribou in Norway. Um, they they seem to like to itch themselves on our camera equipment. There's not a lot of trees. In fact, there's no trees in Norway. So um, they're probably pretty itchy. Uh, and so when they see our camera, they think, oh man, that's, that looks great. Uh, I think that's about it. I don't know, Megan. What else have we seen? Just piles and piles of reindeer in, in Svalbard. I think that has been um, really fun actually going through all of the imagery and video that we've captured in Svalbard is just more reindeer than polar bear, frankly. <laughs> and I would add, a, we've seen a lot of blowing snow. <laughs> it's, that comes with the territory, I guess. So there's a good example yeah. right there. Too funny. Yeah. Well, I should say to our viewers as well here, if you're interested in kind of camera capture in the north, um, this isn't part of our research project, but it is a fantastic long running partnership we have is with explore.org. And we do have cameras running in the Churchill area year round. And you can take a peek at what those cameras bring you at different times of year. Right now there's the Northern Lights cam running all the time at night and the views are insane so if you ever want to check out the northern lights check out this camera it's beautiful we also do have a couple cameras out at what's called cape churchill which is way east of churchill manitoba right on the coast it kind of overlooks both the hudson bay and the land and so the things we see on this camera especially in the spring and summer are fantastic a lot of caribou also but we also see when polar bears start coming back to land in the summer the sea ice melts in this area every summer so the bears are on land and then when the ice reforms, the bears head out, but there's always interesting things going on out there. And then in the fall is of course the big polar bear migration in Chilter, Manitoba. Again, the bears have been on land for months on end, not eating. They're waiting for the ice to come back. And in the fall, they start congregating as the temperatures drop and it starts getting colder because they know pretty soon the ice is coming back and they wanna be first out there to go hunt seals again. So they gather along the coast and we're able to actually be there with live streaming cameras and you can watch what the polar bears are doing and this last fall was incredible we saw like bj had mentioned the mom with triplets we saw wolverine we saw a seal kill a poor seal kind of got turned around and ended up on shore and was uh, lunch for about 20 different polar bears on land so the things we see on cameras is really fantastic they're such a great way to you know, keep the animals undisturbed, but also get incredible footage and knowledge from what's going on in these areas. Oh, and I can't forget, we do have a summer beluga cam as well. If, if anyone's looking for ways to kill the time in the summer here, there's an underwater beluga cam in the Churchill River. We take it out on a boat and you can watch this incredible Arctic species who also depends on Arctic sea ice for survival uh, in the summer months. So cameras are such a great way to see what's going on in the natural world. And we're so thrilled to be living in a time where we have this technology and can keep pushing this technology forward. So we're going to take another question. Megan, I'm going to throw this one back to you. It might involve a little math unless you know the number off the top of your head. Um, but Ryan is asking, how many cubs can one polar bear have during their lifetime? Oh, man, that's a great question. I'm going to have to do a little math. So I think a, a very lucky polar bear would start producing cubs at around age six. And if that polar bear mom is really lucky, she has two cubs and she's going to have to wait at least about three years before she can have another set of twins. So let's see, a polar bear mom might uh, be reproductively active until they're about 15 years old. So let's say 10 years of reproductive activity with cubs every three years. Um, I'm going to say a lucky polar bear mom has six to eight cubs in her lifetime. It's a great answer. Thank you, Megan. We get that question occasionally, so now we have a better answer for it. So we're going to slowly start wrapping up here, but please, if you do have more questions, we do have time to take a couple more, so send them in. Uh, but I want to, again, kind of go bigger picture. We've talked a lot about moms and cubs today, about polar bears in general. They are experiencing 
their habitat loss, sea ice loss due to climate change in the Arctic. We found out why that's happening because we're burning too many fossil fuels. And so what we need to do is do an energy shift over to solar and wind. It's great when we know what the problem is because then we can come up with the solution. So we do have these solutions and we're gonna play a video for you at the end of this broadcast about what we can do. It's also important to talk about it. And that's part of International Polar Bear Day, talking about polar bears, about what's going on with polar bears, why we care about them, why they're so cool and why it's worth protecting their future because protecting the polar bear's future means protecting our own future. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to the forest. Arctic sea ice is growing the base of the food chain in the Arctic. And the sea ice grows these little micro plants that feed the little creatures, the copepods, that feed the fish, that feed the seals, that feed the whales and the polar bears. And it's so, so critical that we keep this Arctic food chain functioning because there are also people that live across the Arctic and depend on this healthy ecosystem for food and for their livelihoods. And so we really do care about Arctic sea ice, not only for polar bears, but also for that whole Arctic ecosystem and ourselves. And the cool thing about Arctic sea ice is that it acts as Earth's air conditioner. Because it's so big and white, it reflects sunlight away from the Earth preventing it from being absorbed into the ocean and so in that way by reflecting the warmth away it cools the entire planet so it really is earth's air conditioner um, right now some of you might be in the depths of winter and you think that sounds crazy but um, i promise you it's important for the whole earth it's important for ourselves no matter where you live no matter where you're tuning in from today that we have arctic sea ice and that we have moms and cubs uh, to help us keep the polar bear population healthy. Megan, could you briefly tell us why are moms and cubs so specifically important when it comes to the broader polar bear population? Why do we have to protect them? To protect them. I think that's just a fantastic um, question to, to think about because um, raising cubs is the most critical part in a polar bear's life cycle. A mom hasn't eaten, the cubs are, are really small when they're born. It's, it's a very fragile period. But those cubs are critical for the next generation of polar bears. If cubs don't survive into adulthood to become parents themselves, the population will, will decline. And so putting denning areas and ensuring that moms have the time and, and space they need to, to safely raise those cubs is, is critically important for polar bear populations as a whole. That's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that's that's why we are so committed to protecting these families in ways that, you know, help help them and ultimately also help protect people as well. And again, everything we do for polar bears is good for us as well. Um, I, there's another question. BJ, I'm going to start with you and we can throw it back to Megan. It's a great question. This one cracks me up. This is from Russell. Do cubs ever hurt each other like baby eagles so they get all the food? It's like, oh, I used to hurt my baby brother when I was little to get all the food, but do cubs ever do that? <laughs> Whoa, that is a great question. You know, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen evidence. You know, we, we see such a small glimpse on the camera of, of really the full kind of life of a baby polar bear. You know, we see them for sometimes a day, sometimes a week. And then, you know, they disappear from the camera's view. And if we're lucky, maybe one of the other researchers will pick up the bear in the next, you know, 10 years, 15 years. I mean, that's how, that's how little we see of these animals. So what we see mostly is play behavior. These cubs are super cute. They're like puppies rolling around, just being super goofy, not really coordinated yet. I mean, this is a good example of these these two cubs here, you kind of see them scampering, slowing down, tipping over. You know, that's a lot of what we see. I don't think I've ever seen one, you know, make it look like it was trying to hurt its brother or sister. Um, you know, they definitely tackle and wrestle a little bit like you might imagine, but uh, uh, it all seems like it's harmless play. Good question. I don't know, Megan, what do you got? I, th I think I would agree with that assessment. They they definitely they remind me of my kids when you know when they were little. There's a, <laughs> there's definitely some some competition for resources, best angle, and I have to also throw in that you know I work for the San Diego Zoo, and our zoo, like a number of other zoos, you know we have polar bears and other bear species, and so we get some more insight into some of the behavior that would happen inside a den in, in nature, but we can view it through our cameras here at the zoo. 
and, and watching young cubs in the den interact with each other, it is a never ending wrestle fest. And so I, I don't think injury is, is likely, but I think there's probably some dynamics in there that one, one cub is trying to demonstrate its superior strength or, or favoriteness. I love that. Russell Fest is a great way to start wrapping up uh, this webcast. Thank you so much. Like BJ mentioned, you know, there we have been able to watch moms and cubs and get some incredible footage and learn about them thanks to technology. But there's still so much we don't know. And for the vast majority of a polar bear's life, there are no humans watching. And so we are so committed to learning more about polar bears in a way that will benefit them and their conservation. And we're so committed to protecting their future. And thanks to viewers like you, we are confident that we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic always. So thank you for watching today. Thank you for taking part in International Polar Bear Day. Thank you for talking about climate change, for talking about polar bears, for looking at ways to switch our energy sources from fossil fuels to cleaner sources like wind and solar. And we are gonna wrap up with a great video on how youth can take action all over the world. But please do stay in touch. If you do have questions, continue to put them in the chat box and stay tuned to other things we're doing this week. We're always here to answer your questions. So thank you so much and happy International Polar Bear Day. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.